The stellate ganglion is a sympathetic chain ganglion, which means it is a, a hub where we have signals coming from the brain to the spinal cord. And then that spinal cord is going to send out some little rami out into this little node. And they're going to come from multiple segments in that cord. And then that node is going to send a nerve. So that node is called is a ganglion. And it's going to send out some nerves that then go into other areas. So one of the things that's really interesting about our bodies is that the sympathetic nerves one of the roles of a certain type of those nerves is to go basically run right alongside all of the blood vessels in the body and keep them at the right at the right tension and keep them synced up which is really kind of cool so imagine you're going down the highway you've got tons and tons of like telephone poles or like electric wires that are traveling with the highway they're going together so we've got the traffic and we've got that electrical signal as well. That's kind of goes everywhere. All our blood vessels have um, these electrical lines that go with them, these nerves. And these are sympathetic nerves in nature. That's the way they're built. So those, the starting place from those only occurs, though, from like this part of your spine down into like just below, like into your abdomen, basically. They only go to this area. So we need these ganglion to be able to go to our head and to our legs and all that place so we can, we can push them around. And... So the ones that go up into your head and control the sympathetic nerves and then largely the nerves that go to like the vessels in your head come through the stellate ganglion and the upper cervical ganglion. So what some people do is they actually started doing this as a way to modify some things for people with headache, which turned into PTSD, and then which turned into POTS just based on the arousal component. But the thing to consider is the main job of those sympathetic nerves when they're going into the vessels of the head, they're actually going to make the, them like shut off. So the same way that we create tension throughout the body and like every heartbeat is this big electrical pulse and all the vessels move and work together. We should kind of have a, a corollary of that in our head. But when we do the stellate ganglion block, we have those vessels become what is called pressure passive, which just means they kind of loosen up and they go kind of limp on you. So you no longer have that control in the brain. So if you're somebody that's already having a hard time perfusing in the brain, we're not doing any favors by taking away the control system. Usually we're trying to make the control system work better. Um, so sometimes that that is the outcome. Now there are times when people are having things like high anxiety, high arousal, high, like these kind of high output states where doing that take some of that spasm away and it gives people some relief, um, which can be helpful, but those are kind of solving for two different sides of that, of that spectrum. Why would someone be able to talk, but if you switch from talking to reading out loud, it triggers symptoms? Great question. Sometimes, so let's think about it. What are we adding to the context? If you're just speaking and then you, in this, Cadence doesn't change, nothing changes, we're saying everything's the same. And then we start to read. Now we want to consider what is new about reading. Okay, a couple things. Number one might be I'm now using my eyes to focus them on these targets. I'm moving my eyes accurately around. I'm having to process what I'm seeing and then convert that into words. If we're saying speech-wise, if I'm just processing and speaking and I can do that, but when I go to add the reading part, it messes me up, there might be a component with that eye movement or with the processing of vision that's problematic. Number two might be, it could be that maybe your position changes. So I know for me, if I sit down and read the girls' books, and if I'm like crushed into their little bunk bed, sometimes that'll make it so that like I gotta you see me do it in here even or I'll sit up so I can breathe and speak more clearly um, or maybe like we talked about with the teeth position earlier where if I'm looking down that might make it so that my eyes actually change their position relative to each other and it's harder for them to be able to sync up and communicate which may lead to a different outcome with processing as well it may make the processing harder it's similar to what we talked about with driving on the freeway, causing symptoms to get worse as well. So you can just kind of poke through and think about what's different. Position, what my eyes are doing. Is the light different? Is the processing different? Is my speech different? And then, and then that might be an indicator for you. Why would you develop POTS or dysautonomia during pregnancy and it doesn't go away? That's a pretty common one. Pregnancy can be one of those catalyst moments. And it can be a catalyst for 
like different subsets of reasons, right? So they can be catalysts because we have physical strain and injury that just happens to the body as someone's giving birth, right? It's a big event, a lot going on. It can also be relative to the downshifting or changing in the body that occurs relative to you know, like building another human, letting them go, and then trying to normalize your body again can be from iatrogenic causes, stuff in the hospital, you get different injections, you get sick, um, you may have to have a surgery while you're there, those things may do it. You may be under anesthesia, you may be all these different things, right? Um, so like all of those things can all input it. Or it could be just like overkill stress of the moment and then that can cause a problem or you know, on and on and on and on. So within that particular catalyst, then you start pulling apart the mechanisms of like, okay, well, what are all the different categories of things that changed and then how might those things affect where I'm at? I also want to take this moment while I have you guys just to try to be encouraging in terms of like spending some time thinking about like, how can I narrow this down a little bit? And then what steps can I start to take, even if they're small, slow steps? Small, slow is probably going to win the game for a lot of you. So even if they have things that just feel small, that you can do them every day and take them as a win, I just want to encourage you on that. I just want to encourage you, if you're having days that you're starting to string together some good things, give yourself some grace on that. Give yourself some credit. Most of you are pretty higher charging people and like a little hard on yourself sometimes. Give yourselves credit, okay? And then so many of you have been so gracious to each other and supportive of each other in the chats and just being able to talk to each other. I really appreciate that. I know a lot of people are here feeling like there's not a lot of people in the world that understand them. So thank you to all of you for giving everyone a place to come and, and feel good about that, but then also be able to push each other and to be able to um, to work our way out of it, not just have this be a place where we just kind of like have a a rah-rah session, but how can we start to put rubber to the road and keep people on the road too, even when it's hard. So thank you guys so much. I really appreciate it. I know I didn't get to all the questions, but I'm trying and we'll just keep doing it.